Here we are in London at uh, yes. the, the Institute of Directors. So uh, let's introduce each other. So you, Great. Uh, this is Robert Turczyk. Hello. Hi, Rob Turczyk. Great to see you. Fine to, fine what, to, what do you do? You. Explain. Oh, well, right now what I'm doing is I'm advising media companies, big and small, about what to do next. And that could be, next could be next month, next year, or several years out. But what's really interesting to me right now is if you think five years into the future, most people have a vision of their business five years in the future, but it's more or less an incremental change from what they're currently doing. And then if you ask them to look back five years, all of a sudden we realize, wow, there are a lot of new things in the world that weren't there five years ago. Right. The iPhone, the smartphone, you know, uh, YouTube's grown so tremendously in the last five years. Facebook has grown tremendously in the last few years. Even how mobile has pervaded our lives is shifted in such a big way because um, all the numbers, all the numbers for mobile around the world have grown enormously in the last few years. So mobile was always important. We always knew it would be important. But now we've reached this tipping point where a billion people, a billion people are carrying around smartphones with cameras. <laughs> and suddenly we're seeing 100 hours of video uploaded every minute and, and to YouTube. And soon to be 5 billion, right? So, yes. So, so uh, let me go back to the beginning for a second. So I'm sure. Leonhard Futurist, uh, author, keynote speaker, and I, I met Robert on the internet, so to speak. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> not, not like what it sounds. That's right. <laughs> not on a dating site. <laughs> but basically, we, we talk about media and content and, and paid content and how to monetize. And it's very much alike our message. That's right. Well, I've been a fan of yours for years because I found your thoughts about music are informative, not just for the music industry, but now just about every business is turning into media, and where music goes, media will follow. So in a way, you pioneered this path long before any of us. Yeah, well, you know, music was pretty straightforward. But let's talk about maybe a, a quickly back and forth about the key yeah. trends for media companies whether sure. publishers or, or record labels or movie companies okay. or broadcasters. So uh, maybe we can just ping pong back and forth yeah. quickly. You know, what, what are the th key things happening right now and what, what do they need to actually look at? Well, I think one of the most important things, if I were in a media company today, which I'm not, thankfully, the most important thing is that I believe the big media companies have lost the ability to innovate, to truly radically innovate their business. And Did they ever? Well, they were able to bring out hits and they weren't afraid, they weren't averse to big media transformation on a decade by decade basis, right? Well, the TV um, guys weren't, but the TV, record labels the, didn't want the CD. Well, that's they true. Didn't they want resisted the it. Well, you could say the same with television, right? Because they <laughs> fought cable, then they accepted it because it turned out to be a good business. Then they fought the Netflix, VCR, yeah. and the VCR became a good business. Then they fought the DVR, it turns out that works too. So, the same, we same have story, the media right? industry has a tendency to fight the future, but every 10 years or so, they embrace a change. What's happening now that's important they need to recognize is the rate of innovation is accelerating because the obstacles for a startup company have basically gone away. You know, so now you've got the crowd and the cloud and this knocks out enormous amounts of cost and it gives you a great, great scale very quickly. Social is like a free way to get marketing out there. Well, this is an important part of the cloud, right? Yes. Because when I did a startup in the 90s, we had to write, I think we spent a million dollars on just infrastructure. Exactly right. And, and now you can just go rent for five dollars, you can rent something at, at Amazon. Garrett, that was true and, and until, it, right? until 2007 <laughs> or 2008, right? And, and that's, right. that's the point of Amazon now. In the past, if you were going to, let's say you're going to invest in a company as a VC, you would ask the company to show you their plan for scalability. You know, the, the question would be, well, if you're successful, how are you going to manage growth? It was always an issue. And so companies had to have a plan for that. Yeah. Now your plan is, let's just go stick it up on Amazon and find out. And if we need more scale, we can buy it tomorrow. No problem. We can get it in 15 minutes. So that, that removes not just that cost or that investment, but also the time that it took to figure out that plan, to build that infrastructure, the waste of money, the personnel that you needed to run all that equipment. That's all gone now. But so companies can move much faster. Isn't part of the innovation problem, I mean, you're, you're based in the US and Los Angeles. Yes. I'm based over here, which is you know, def definitely different worlds. But, but in terms of the uh, ability to innovate, isn't part of the problem that I find with my clients from the movie business or publishers is that they don't want to change the existing paradigm of business relationships, and they don't want to self-cannibalize. They'd rather be uh, they'd rather be eaten than to eat each other. Right. They they keep telling <laughs> themselves that, yeah. right? And they've been saying that story for more than a decade. Right. I used to hear that when I was at Sony Pictures in the 1990s. Oh well, the new businesses, the d digital business doesn't generate as much revenue, so we're not ready to turn the lights off on our old business. We're going to keep that going for a while. Right. Well, you know, now I work with big media companies that say the exact same thing. It's 10 years later. What they're failing to notice, first of all, those digital businesses are now pretty big and they monetize pretty well. So at some point, they are going to need to confront that piece of the equation, which is 
you know, if you keep staying with a dwindling business, your business will dwindle fast. You know this because of music. But there's a second piece there as well, I think, and that's about the speed of innovation or the resistance to innovation. So if the way you look at all new media and all new, new innovation is it's a threat to my revenue, it's a threat to my ecosystem, it's a threat to my existing business, it's a threat to my intellectual property, then basically you're conditioning your entire organization to view the future as a threat. And you're conditioning, conditioning them to inaction. So when I talk to big media companies and I get to meet their piracy yeah. departments, I say, you guys are the reason this company has lost its ability to innovate because you've taught everybody here that the future is bad, the future is evil, it's something we have to fight, we need new rules, new laws to shut it down. And that's actually a mistake. So I will give you the example of television. In TV, there are dozens of really cool video startups that wanted to partner with TV companies and help yeah. them transition. We saw this with they've, music, they've right? Google now. <laughs> and well, no, what happens is the, they get sued into submission, right? Because the piracy team looks and says, yeah, but you don't have permission to be doing what you're doing, so they've taken the court. And now that, that startup company that could have been so helpful, instead, now they're tied up in a court case. They might win. Look at Vio. Vio just won a lawsuit. The mm -hmm. lawsuit lasted for about five years. So they finally won. It's a startup internet video company. The problem is Vio's out of business. So they won, but it was a pyrrhic victory because now there's no company left. I, I use this, you know, I use this image for my a lot of my clients when I say basically you're living under a, a dome, right? Yeah. A, a bubble, like a, a dome, like a uh, like a, um, a Mars station or something. Yeah. Right? You're living in there, and inside of this dome, it's it's your environment. You're mm -hmm. making, you're making the oxygen. You're making the rules. You're making the money. That's right. And as long as you do that, everything is fine. But what happens now because of the web? is that people are drilling holes into the dome yeah. everywhere. Uh, and the they're going in under the ground. And, and the atmosphere out here is different from the atmosphere in there. Yeah. And yeah. if they haven't had time to adapt to that atmosphere, they get explosive decompression and they get killed. They get it's like, out. you know, for example, in Indonesia, you have 82% of the population watches cable TV and satellite TV yeah. without having it. Right? Oh, uh, that's and, rough. And, and yeah. some other way, or in Brazil, yeah. it's 68% or so. Yeah. So this over-the-top idea would be the only way to get them as part of a bundle. Yeah, that's right. So but look, this rethinking. You know. But that is a factor that is not news, right? Watching internet video, well for any other video has been around since the 90s, but really with the advent of broadband and services like YouTube, suddenly around 2007, 2008, this became a habit, new habit. And the usage pattern is very different, particularly now that people are looking on mobile. So what have the TV companies done? Well, they've kept their content to themselves. They refuse to license it out to new companies. Look at Warner Brothers' refusal to deal with Netflix, for instance, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. they withhold their content. They sue wherever they can to try to stop them. And now that doesn't grow their business. What it actually does is it trains an entire generation in, on how to use BitTorrent. Because the fact is today- Sure, sure it creates piracy. We're here, we've, uh, I've been doing this since 1994, really, in 2000, I started with the futuring stuff. You were an executive before, Yeah. now we're here and, and we've, we have some learnings and we've done thousands of sessions. I've done, in fact, 1,600 uh, presentations. That's either good or exhausting, it's hard to tell which it is. <laughs> yeah, well, a bit more than I was a musician even, but in any case, so we have some learnings. Let's put some learnings on the table. Yeah. And, uh, if we're gonna go forward into five years, you know, what do we have to actually, what do media companies have to embrace today uh, if they had the guts, you yeah. know, which we decided that they don't really have the guts, but that's, that's fine out. Uh, so you guys out there, if you have the guts, here's some bottom line. Well, I think a spirit of radical openness is something they need to embrace because we know this from the web, right? Open standards, open APIs, open source software, open platforms. That seems to work really well if you want rapid scale and invite others in to innovate with you. Media companies are not set up for openness or transparency. Everything's secret. Every deal's done yeah. in back rooms. I, I use a Tim O'Reilly quote. You know, the uh, U.S. publisher Tim O'Reilly from mm -hmm. O'Reilly yeah, Publishing. He he says basically it's uh, you you you're as much open as much as you can. The monetization sometimes requires a bit of closing. Yeah. Uh, so it's not a black or white thing. Right. But I call this open A map. Open as much as possible. Oh, that's good. Right? Yeah, that's about right. <laughs> right? That's about right. Uh, because you know you can't you can't make money when everything is open. But open doesn't mean free. Yes, but, that's right. But at the same time, it acquires the audience when yeah. you're open. Right? That's it. Right? And people want to feel like they're part of this, right? The whole point of collaborative software and participatory media is the audience wants to have a meaningful right. role. 
So today, if I were a producer, I would definitely cast my audience in a role where they had a chance to do something meaningful, not just tweet it or retweet it. But when it. you do that, you give them some control, right? Because you do. You the lose control. Is, you know, when right. people are saying open, it means more risk. And it's one well, also right. it's participation risky. means right. you need to let more people in at the it's table. It's risky to be open. It right. is risky, but on the other hand, it's much riskier, I think, to be entirely closed when you see the rapid scale these companies are changing at or these industries are changing. Uh, I think the biggest risk of all is to try to maintain tight control. That's an illusion, and that way lies disaster. Okay, so that's rule number one. Rule number two, uh, let me chime in on this one. Sure, okay. yeah. Rule number two is that basically now we have what I call the digital default. Right? Oh, I like that. Right. Tell me about that. Yeah, everything, everything is going digital and into right. the cloud. That's you know, my true. health records, my movies, yeah. and, and it's all based on the, you know, I click and it goes. Yeah, that's right. right. So a uh, digital default also means I buy stuff online, I compare things online, I rate my doctor, right. you know, I, I use um, the map to find my way. And if it's not um, in the cloud, it doesn't really exist. Basically, right? if, you don't, if you're not in that digital place, yeah. you don't exist. It's true. Right. So if somebody's looking for a service that will travel with them across devices and your company doesn't provide it, it doesn't mean that they're going to buy your content somewhere else. Well, like it on used KTV. to, and this is no longer working, okay. right? Because that's the dome. It used right? to mean that. Right? So, uh, for example, sports. Now, sports is next in this line of, of disruption, right? <laughs> sure. Right? Because sports, you couldn't watch the game unless you had ESPN or whatever right. it was, or, or, or HBO, or um, whatever channel it was running on, right? Like, the sports rights are highly contested and yeah, very valuable. Yeah, and they're very expensive. So now it's moving into apps, it's moving right. into... That's true. Right? Well, here's where that's interesting. So that actually pits sports leagues against broadcast companies, Yes. who used to be partners. It was a very lucrative business partnership. In the U.S., the most successful mobile app is Major League Baseball, and they publish it themselves. Yes, I used to have it. It's a great app. And <laughs> but it's it cost, locked out mostly here. It's cost, it cost $120. Like, it, most mobile apps cost a buck or two bucks, right? 120 but that makes sense because they have so, content and fans who want to reach These them. are the food chain conflicts, right? Mm -hmm. So Yeah, that's true. Part of the food chain conflict means that I think as a, as a broadcaster, for example, or as a, a studio, you have to move out of, outside the silo. Yes. So you're in the silo of making content, and these guys are in the silo of being a telecom. That's true. And these guys are in the silo of tech. And now devices, they're all right? jumping into each other's game. And now right? that's not true, right? Yeah. You're not in a silo anymore. So you have to, if you're a studio, you're a tech company, you're, you're an advertiser, you're yeah, a brander, you're, you're, you know, you're doing all these things, and now the brands are becoming broadcasters? themselves, look at Nike and Red Bull and... Everybody can go right. direct to the consumer and that's a shock, right? In the past, advertisers had to go through a network and, then, and even the cable channels, they weren't direct to consumer, they went through a cable operator or a satellite operator, right. but now everyone's in a rush to go direct. Not everybody's good at this. This so is a rule number four, actually, you could summarize. Oh, okay. I, I always say, well, I think it's good to have some numbers here, right? Rule number four is that if it can go direct, it will. Yeah, that's right. right. And if you don't do it, someone else will. Whether it's Kickstarter or, or, or Netflix or Hulu Plus or right. whatever, true. if it can go direct, it will. Yes. This also goes for talent. Yes. Right. Yes, yeah, uh, so the idea of withholding your content from a marketplace because you think it's not priced right or doesn't fit your yeah. business model, you're not withholding it or preserving any value. All you're doing is depriving yourself of the opportunity to learn, participate, grow, gain some knowledge. And it, look, the greatest example of this is Game of Thrones because yeah, this is absolutely. not just the greatest TV show and maybe the best example of kind of pay TV ecosystem. It's also the most pirated show in the world. So really what HBO has done is it's training an entire generation how to use BitTorrent. More people are watching Game of Thrones via BitTorrent than are watching it on HBO as legitimate payers. So this is a crazy phenomenon. Of it's sort of a the, paradox. The tough part being is that these things used to work, right? Yes, so you, that's for, right. you force people into a certain behavior, yeah. and they didn't have much else what they could do. So it's like the banks, you know, they forced us to pay them all these fees and stuff, right? <laughs> right. And now we just use the mobile. That's right. You know, or, or we use PayPal or Bitcoin. And, maybe and telecoms, right? right? Skype is Same wiping thing. out telecom. There's so much innovation in messaging. It's not just media. It's actually sort of pervading every industry. Right. Wherever it touches media or communication or data or information, all of those things now are up on the web and in the cloud. Okay, part number five. Yes, part number five, it, we're, we're already there, it's mobile. Right. So people talk about mobile first or mobile only, and this is not necessarily a helpful frame. The main message is you've got to move mobile to the center of your business because that's how we use it as users, right? So right. we use our mobile phone constantly. The mythological figure is 150 times a day. No one can prove whether that's true. But the fact is, you do use your mobile a lot. You look at it first thing in the morning. You look at it at night. Right. You know, you're using it for all your apps. And so in a way, I think of it as like my ignition key. And just yesterday, here in London, I was showing some friends media on their Apple TV with my iPhone. Yeah. And it was kind of cool. It was like I brought my whole media collection with me over here to Europe. 
And that's a, that's a thing that I encourage every media executive to get their head wrapped around is how people are really using mobile because it's really rapidly becoming the first screen. I know that's a crazy thought because most yeah, people... It's basically the this multi-screen uh, device uh, usage, right? And yes. the other thing is social, local, mobile, solo mode, yeah. as people are saying. Right? That's right. I think the problem is that lots of people who are in the media business, especially publishers, they don't live in that world. You know, they, they right. live in the world of the television over here, newspaper here, and the mobile for email. Well, and their experience right? is so limited in so many ways, right? So you, have, you have to actually live in the social, local you mode. Do. Yeah, you do. We're, we're going to say, I think the numbers are really quite shocking in... Uh, Probably by 2007, we'll have 5 billion people connected to the web. Right. 80% of that will be on mobile devices. Which is why Zuckerberg is already talking about 3 billion on Facebook. 3 billion, right? But they're halfway there already. And we know 2 billion more will come. I, I, I think they'll get to 3 billion. But I mean, basically, what's happening is the social networks are the next broadcasters. Yeah. Right? Yeah, uh, that's a good way to Broadcasting to each other. So. Right. And so the mobile thing is a centerpiece of this. But yes. uh, one advice to the audience out there. If you if you don't really if you're not close to this, then spend four weeks doing everything you do only with the mobile. Yes, and, and then you'll understand yeah. what it means. Yeah, exactly. And, and not not talking about just the mobile handset, but also tablets right? and, and it's downloading funny. your content and, and watching your content stuff, and right? bring your PowerPoint presentation or right. maybe keynotes better. So next point relates to that. I think is uh, what I call big data. Yeah, that's connected. And exactly. It's right. the idea of what well, I don't call it that. It's this is a, a, one of those taglines that everybody's laundering yeah. all day long, yeah. like social media. But anyway, big data basically means uh, an unheard of volume, volume, variety, uh, velocity, and value of, of new kinds of data that's coming. So right. this is huge, a huge wave of data that's coming that allows people to be uh, analyzed and customized for advertising yeah. uh, and all these things. So big data is now becoming a major driver of media it because, is. because data is the oil of the, of the economy now. Right? I agree with you, but I think a lot of people in the media business fail to understand what big data really means. So, you know, we think of a proprietary data asset. That's a concept that really fits on a social media site because the users are generating all this content and there's, there's both the social graph and the interest graph, so we can extract a lot of interesting uh, patterns from that. Now think about a media company, when they think about their proprietary data asset, it's usually a show or a song. These are very poor digital assets. In a digital environment, they're easily stolen, the value is quickly depleted, they're very expensive to produce, they're hard to protect, so they don't really perform well in a two-way network. But they're missing the point. If that's all they focus on, what they're missing is that there's two other layers of data. Each piece of content has metadata around it, and there's a lively competition springing up right now. This is a very rich area for innovators because media companies have missed it; they're blind to it. So, innovation, innovative companies are creating metadata and they're aggregating Meta and content, exchanging. Basically, yeah, it's well, it's the content that yeah. wraps around the yeah. content, and then there's the usage pattern. So, you know, for instance, if you look at a cable TV company, they have knowledge of what every single person is doing. They just have really crappy systems for tracking it and extracting it and turning it into something usable. Well, I think one of the uh, things that I'd like to uh, say about this is basically that um, in, in some instances, the meta content, the metadata may be more valuable than the content itself. It's possibly true, yeah, right? Because, because it generates this, this, this glue, this layer. Right? Yes. So if you get permission from the user, yeah. if you get them to participate, then it becomes something that's really valuable. So basically, the value is generated around the content. Yeah, that's and right. Like you can see, for example, in in, uh, in, in books or, or magazines like The Economist, the value is around this content, for example, by listening the to conversation, the conversation, the comments, the, the hub, link backs. Best example, totally. you know, or right. the Atlantic magazine, or yeah. you know what have you. They're creating this huge thing around it. Right? Yeah. So big data, in my view, is a major driver of, in, in fact, of course, it relates to advertising. Yeah. Uh, so when you have exact data and the television, this is a scary thought, right? The television knows who you are. It should, right? Well, well maybe, 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 yeah. maybe it should not. But, but basically, all of these devices know who we are because of what we have allowed to share. Right. And but so we, we don't really listen carefully to that data. In the media business, like we're deaf to that no, information. No, but I mean, uh, Google and Facebook and others. And this, the this, new Microsoft, yeah. the Xbox right. One, is designed for this, right? And, so and Intel has a proposal to this they effect. They do right? as well. That's right. And so, so, that, so does Cisco and others. Right? So look at it this way. The, the TV companies fail to innovate. Fifteen years ago, I was talking to cable operators about a new kind of set-top box that would be able to track people's usage and cameras that could see you know, the retina and register individual people. We could sub-segment the household and all this mm -hmm. stuff. We could tell if it was a dog watching or a human being. <laughs> and they recoiled from it. But now Microsoft, the Xbox One, they've introduced it. So you could say, gee, the, the incumbent companies failed to innovate. They had the opportunity. We even explained how to do it to them. 
and they failed completely and utterly to see the possibility. Now a new generation of companies is coming, and they see that as their opportunity, mm -hmm. and it will redefine the business. So what's happened is that failure to innovate within these industries means doesn't stop innovation. It just means innovation is driven outside, and it grows up, and it takes a long time, so you don't see it right away, but now all of a sudden, those information empires on the internet but are so much bigger than the traditional media. I companies. think this failure to innovate is largely based on on the uh, orthodoxies, you know, the assumptions of, of <laughs> right, life. Right, right. That's you true. know, that they can innovate if they ever decided to, but you know, they believe, for example, like record labels believe that controlling a copy is the ultimate paradigm. Right. Uh, and so they sued fifty thousand people, and a decade later they're making seventy percent less money. So, so it's it's a question of your belief. Right. And so now the film, st film studios are following that same strategy and they're suing even more people and it doesn't work for them. Well, I, I think the so bottom line is if you're, if you're a publisher, you should get a big data officer and you should yeah, figure out true. what to do about data that's and true. all these things and how to use these assets and how to work with companies that, that are the new oil companies. Many people are saying, in fact, Google is the next Exxon. Sorry, Google. Uh, I don't think you are. But in any case, uh, you know, and, and many people are saying Google is the next Matrix now, which is kind of interesting as well. Uh, potentially, but yeah. Let's talk about advertising. So how is advertising changing? Because, you know, there's roughly, uh, what is it, $650 billion a year spent on advertising. Yeah. And if that is going away from um, traditional television, yeah. Um, so, what's going to happen with that? Well, so it hasn't gone away. So the, the, the sad news for all those online video companies is that they haven't actually been very successful in, in turning TV dollars into internet dollars. They'd like to, they keep getting better at making a proposition, but advertisers are quite conservative and so those dollars stay with TV and they probably will for a little while. But there are a couple changes coming, so we, see, we can start to see the outline of the change. The first one is this year at the upfront in New York, all the big broadcasters came in and their big message was multi-platform. Everybody talked multi-platform. You could buy all at once. Yeah. What they're really saying is we're putting some of our shows on some of these devices and then they point back to TV because that's still where the big dollars are. But they heard the message, advertisers want multi-platform. All right, fine, we'll give you that, right? So they're working on that. The second thing to pay attention to now is increasingly ad, ad agencies in New York, particularly the media buyers, the digital side is taking over the traditional side. And so what you're going to start to see is all those metric-driven automated tools from the web, they're going to start to pervade the traditional media. Then traditional media will start to resemble the web much more, and you'll see the two things blend together more. Yeah. So that's good. And then finally, I would observe this. Advertising used to be a creative business. Think Mad Men, right? Yeah. It's not. Now it's an analytics number driven. It's a big data business, just like you were saying yeah, a minute yeah. ago. Advertising is a big data business now. That's a shock to the people in advertising. The creative people find this anathema when I say it, but it's absolutely the case now. It's a numbers driven, analy analytics driven business. Much of that's driven by the experience on the web where you can literally A B test, you can do a real time exchange, you can buy an exact audience, deliver precisely to that audience things that were unthinkable in traditional media, but increasingly that too will start to show up on television, music, and so on. I think, you know, of course, that the saving grace of what we're seeing in television is that it's actually converging with the internet. Yeah, that's and, right. And with mobile, that's and, right. and with social. That's why I'm so bullish on video, because, yeah. I mean, TV might have its challenges, but video consumption well, is going up Basically, I think if, if you're looking at the advertising pie expanding because of gamification and, yeah. and apps and so on, then television can be part of that expansion by yeah, being of part of the offering. That's exactly which, right. Which, unlike publishers, it's very easy for them to do, for example, second screen and those kind of things, right? Mm -hmm. While a publisher that is completely spoiled by the by the huge margins of the past, you know, looking at the the the, uh, the analog dimes coming in or mm -hmm. pennies, right? Then it's not the same. So it's harder for them because they don't right. uh, they don't have the attention monopoly any longer. Right. So if you if you had a magazine, you had a monopoly by the fact that everybody had it. Yeah, uh, and that's much easier for them to uh, to pull up the same kind of uh, head out of the uh, the rabbit hole they had, you know. But you know, all these space. companies find when when they do jump over the digital divide and start to become digital companies, they discover to their dismay that the margins are lower on the web because there's a hell of a lot well, more competition. I, I, but I think here's the the bottom line. And this is I, I was trying to tell my client. Yes, it's it may even just be one you know ten percent uh -huh. of what you made before. But the global audience of it's five billion bigger. people connected. You got it. That's right. Uh, you know, and, and if they're all going to be fan of of, uh, of your, you know, the, uh, the Lily Hammer show or whatever, you can advertise on that, and you can have brand and branded content and in stream advertising. Right. You know, that is a lot bigger than anything you ever had. I'm with you. This it's is like I'm like the, like the Kindle. Yeah. If you're going to sell a book for two dollars on the Kindle. But your potential audience is a, a billion. Yeah. Right. You're going to get a lot more people. You're going to make money. You'll make money. you'll make profit. You may not make the same profit margin, 
but you'll reach a bigger audience. And frankly, there's also a limited amount of people's time and attention, so you want that big audience if you can. Here's the way to look at it. Media com traditional media is all about revenue maximization. So that's close it down, lock it off, force a subscription, control the audience, all those things, right? It seems like in digital media, it's all about audience maximization and not necessarily revenue maximization. So the two things are opposite ends of the spectrum, right? If you're going to maximize revenue, you're going to minimize audience. But if you maximize revenue, you have to also have control of the audience, right? Well, and, that's and, very hard to do. And, and, yeah. and you can't do yeah. that anymore. So I call this a transition trauma, right? Yeah. You're, in this, you're in this space where you say you can't control the viewers anymore and the brands uh, and the message. Right? So you can control your own content, but that hasn't really changed. Right? Right. So in the future, you have to find a way that, that you can involve them in this process. And, and this is where the big disconnect is happening. It's true. So it's not that the money isn't there. The money is there. I mean, people yeah. are paying for stuff all over. I mean, look at Netflix, you know, 43 exactly. million subscribers. Yeah. Spotify. And they're right? spending 100 million on a new, a new series. Eh? So uh, I think that was The Economist in the presentation I saw the other day. Uh, I think it was TechDirt, actually. It was talking about the, the primal thing is that we have to look for is a reason to pay. You know, what is my reason to pay for this content? Right. Uh, and it can't just be one reason. For example, you know, I, I'm not subscribing to the New York Times just because the writers are good. I'm going to subscribe. Well, they are good. You know, there's right. no doubt about that. Right. But you know, I'm going to pay 300 bucks for it. So I subscribe to 10 other reasons yeah. that make it iris uh, basically indispensable to my life. Right. And then I'm in. Yeah. Yeah. This is like Major League Baseball app. You know, pay 120 bucks a year. If you're a fan, you indispensable. Want it. It's worth it. Ex exactly. But not if it was $1,000. Probably not, right? Okay. But that would be revenue maximization, right? So they're they're hitting a good balance because they're getting fairly high money for an app, a very high money. Well, it's for a reasonably big audience, audience, you know. That's but true. For example, I, I, I would uh, I would forecast that for books, for example, we're going to see lots of books, novels in the range of a dollar to five dollars. Yeah. Uh, because they'll be written more painlessly and published quicker. Yeah. And without the publisher. Yeah. So an You're author, right. you know. I would pay more for a shorter book. I think there's a lot of the, the model right now is broken, right? You you get someone who wrote a good article for the Atlantic, and then you say, "Great, we want that article turned into a book." So now go add another 160 pages to what really should have been maybe a 40-page piece. Yeah. I'd rather have the 40-page piece, and I'd pay five or six bucks for that, or break it into five books, five mini books, and I'd probably pay a couple bucks for each of those. They, you can assemble that same package. You know, we have this idea that the way media is, or the way we grew up with media, is how it's always going to be. But the fact is, if you look over the long, like, centuries, it changes, right? Charles Dickens used to sell books by the chapter, and that's why his big books, we get them today, you know, bound to really thick like that. People bought them as pamphlets, one by one. That's why each chapter ends with such a great cliffhanger, because he wanted that audience clattering for the next chapter, right? So he got the subscription business. If that's how authors have to write in the future, we'll probably write better. It'll be more entertaining. People will read it more thoroughly. They'll read what they pay for. It, it might actually be better. I think what we're seeing is one of the, uh, the big uh, switches now that we're seeing from the first part of the internet. Now that very soon we're going to have five billion people connected, so yeah. a lot more musicians, publishers, story writers, uh, uh, film producers, and so on, will have a landfill, a huge landfill of stuff. So curation and filtering and me making sense out of it is a huge drop and that's it what is. publishers should be doing. It is. Right. And look, we know this because this happened in the past when the magazine boom yeah, happened. It's going to be even bigger now. I understand, but Reader's Digest emerged as a really yeah. powerful thing because they did a digest. There were so many magazines, nobody could read them all. So they did that for you, right? Harper's used to do this as well, where they would take selections from magazines and gather it into a compilation. Yeah. So for sure, we know this is a proven strategy that works when there's proliferation of content. People will pay for the valuable service. You know, I read your newsfeed for this reason because you're always thank posting you, interesting you. stuff. It's, it's, put, put in the coins. Yeah, right. You need a tip box. I'm going to put up a paywall. There, that's so. exactly right. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I like to keep a bottom line for everything so people can uh, use it for Twitter, right? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, so, what the bottom line for this is basically I think this distribution has been replaced by sense making. Okay. Yeah, that makes so, sense. So distribution is still a big deal. Uh, if you're going to reach 100 million people, you can't do it on the mobile phone quite yet. Right. Uh, and it won't work even for 100,000 people streaming real time in many ways. Right? So that's still a big deal. But very soon, we're, we're, we're seeing the shift over into you're going to pay for sense making and for the content. Yeah. And for the packaging and, and, the, yeah. and the design. That's right. The flipboard. Uh, you're not going to pay for just for having it. Right, and just an undifferentiated web page right. isn't really worth very much, so you're not going to make Like, you know, why do people pay for Netflix? They don't pay for the movies. No, because the interface. They can get the movie anyway. Yeah. But it's low enough to pay for the convenience of all else. Correct. And it's so well done, right? This notion that, just to use your example a little further, Netflix, I can watch, I can start on my phone, 
turn that off. Now look at it on my tablet, it picks up in the exact same spot. Then I go to my TV set, it picks up in the exact same spot coming from my PlayStation or Xbox or Apple TV. This concept, which seems so obvious to everybody who uses Netflix, TV companies still haven't figured out that that's what users want. That's valuable to them because now the content follows them in a way that they can use. So it's convenience, it's utility, it's ease of access, discoverability, findability, all these things you're just describing. <laughs> But when you explain that to a TV person, it's like it's the first time well, I've ever heard one of, I think one of the other challenges in this context is that many of the rights owners, especially the, uh, the larger rights owners, whether they're publishers or movie companies, they want to have this new accomplishment of doing all these things, yeah. but they also want to have the old, which is the control of a distribution, yeah. the windowing, the time releases, you know, the, the, the authority to control whatever the Greek people watch it or the people in Tunisia or whatever. They want all of that, plus they want the new stuff. Yeah. Uh, and that's not possible, so this Correct. is why uh, you can't have the cake and eat it, you can't have control and at the same time have a much larger global audience. Newsflash, yeah. the media business, control <laughs> is an illusion, that was the past. If you're still operating out of that script, you're looking in the rear view mirror even when you're in the fast lane, you're probably going to crash. Yeah, going back to the paradigm of, uh, of uh, Tim O'Reilly, it's very, very important, mm -hmm. I think, that uh, you know, open is how you build an audience, and when you close a little bit, but you make it so it's acceptable, that's how you can monetize. Sure, look at iTunes is a great illustration of yeah, that. Yeah, but right? iTunes, you know, iTunes of course has is, has a walled garden syndrome. Yeah, it and, is, and it has monetized, but it's not going anywhere. It's not it's understood, not, but it's it's open and closed. There was Facebook, right? It's a proprietary platform that's sort of open, and you can sort of innovate on top of it. It's open enough, right? And there's a degree. Maybe they should be more well, open. We, we have the same problem is if you look for example at Spotify, which I I really love Spotify. Just for the record, people say I don't like Spotify, but I do like. I'm a subscriber. They're challenged with uh, their business model, but that's not their okay, problem. Now here's the problem with that's Spotify. The is exactly this problem. Spotify wants to be open and give the music to the world. Yeah, great. You know, even for a dollar a week yeah. or, or for ten dollars a year yeah. in the in the developing countries. Right? And that could only be achieved by bonding with the telecoms. So, okay, cool. so, yeah, so yeah, yeah, because right. because they have the distribution. That would make sense. So the telecoms would love to buy this, yes, but not for ten euros a month. Right? Or ten dollars a month because it's way too expensive. Yeah. But you know, think about this. The labels want to get paid. If two billion users paid a dollar a month, right, it'd be a gigantic right? win right? for the labels. That, that'd be two times. That'd be twenty-four I, billion. I agree. Right? Now the labels are saying yeah, this is all quite nice, but it's a theory because right now we've got CD sales still, and we have iTunes. Yeah. And we want to keep control. So yeah. go bugger off and, and stick with your ten million. And this is this means the death of Spotify in the end. Well, it definitely right? gates their growth, and that is a real problem for no, them. This is a death. Uh, but it's bad. Have, it's right? the record labels' problem, and it's yeah. ultimately going to haunt them as well. This is another example of a media company killing the company that's trying to help it make the transition, because they insist on their old economics. There's a there's a, there's a lesson behind this for the entrepreneurs in the audience. Right. right. Stay yeah. independent. Uh, yeah, and and stay in a place to where you can decide to a large degree, like you know, like YouTube, YouTube did for a long time. We would never have YouTube if uh, if uh, Chad Hurley would have asked the studios for permission. For permission. Yeah, right? that's true. Uh, and of course, a lot of the stuff we do was sort of in the gray zone, you know. But but anyway, we have YouTube, or even firmly in the black zone, yeah. right there. <laughs> we have, pirating. We have YouTube now as the biggest broadcast in the world. Correct. As a result of not playing the game totally by the book. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and every company it has been successful, right? Facebook, there's clearly evidence that in the beginning they bent the rules, maybe broke the rules. Apple, the origins of Apple are kind of murky this way. Bill Gates, the origins of, of, of Microsoft. So innovative companies break things. That's what they do, right? Well, this, is, this is a big deal for the, they're uh, testing the, for the incumbents, right? Disruption. <laughs> yes. Right? And, and uh, again, my bottom line is, you know, you, you disrupt or you are disrupted. Yes. Right. And this is not new, but now on the web, the speed of this is... Yeah, it's fast. Uh, this, it and that's partly because speed. of these things we were talking about a minute ago. The cloud, the crowd, social, mobile, these things allow you to innovate fast with, with not much resource. So now you can launch a mobile app pretty cheaply. We met a guy the other day, young kid who's developed over 80 apps himself. So you know, people are building this stuff on their own and knocking it out. They're hiring people on the. You know, uh, there, the there's there's companies like pharma companies like Genentech. You know, they they have their own app that they give to the to the businesses, their partners, to work with them on new medications and things. Yeah. They have an app store, right? That's right. So why does one of the students have an app store? It makes no sense to me. If I can hire somebody on the web and get them to build an app right. for me in a week, what's wrong with these entertainment companies? There should be an app for everything. So part of it is be to be Apple, app for the producers, and app to submit, and, and they convince yeah. themselves that they have some kind of quality, and therefore they need a lot of approvals and a lot of meetings and a lot of personnel and a lot of stuff. 
Well, because you, you bring this home to Europe here to the uh, European Broadcasting Union, which is the Union of Public Television. Yeah. I held a speech for them three weeks ago, and I can't figure out why they're not getting together. These are the most powerful TV companies in right. Europe. Right, collectively. And they're not getting the together and saying, you know what, we're going to have an app store. Yeah, we're, we're gonna, easily could. We're, we're going to have our own app store, and this yeah. would, would be nothing. You'd find people doing it for free just to be part of it. Plus, they could collaborate on the development of the app, so they could unify metrics across the board. You know, they could build something, a framework that they could all use in modern for their brand and their content and their language, but they could, they could share infrastructure and knock out a lot of the cost. They'll never do it because they always believe they have to control their destiny, they have to be independent, well, this they is need, another, they uh, need this control. Sort of, you now, paradigm problem is this uh, hyper-competition rather yes. than hyper-collaboration. Yes. And now, now, if you're looking at the tech companies, they don't they'll, do they'll collaborate with anyone. You got it. You know what? Because Open they know, APIs, they know what they things, need yeah. to own and then everything else can be free, uh -huh. right? So you, you, you control your piece. But then the rest of the value chain, you can collaborate, you can outsource, you can partly give it away mm -hmm. even, right? It's, it's the rule, actually, uh, Craig Newmark is the pioneer of all this. Yeah. Because he used to say, you know, back in the early days with Craigslist, he'd say, monetize, but don't over-monetize. So know where you get paid. Find that one thing. Control that. But then the rest of it, you can be a little bit more relaxed about the rest of it. And let other people build a business on top. You don't have to own all of that. So, you know, the companies have been successful by allowing third-party developers to come in and build apps. They actually let those companies build pretty successful businesses. This is happening now in the pharma business, this is happening yes. in the car business. I mean, all of the major car companies, I work with some of them, they all have open in innovation sources. Yes. And a lot of the R&D happens from the user. That's right. I mean, this is completely obvious, I think, to anyone looking there. So I think... So why can't I do that on my set-top box from my cable or satellite company? Why don't they let me go out and build an application to manage the UI? Why can't I just get the API data for what channels are where and build some cool navigation system or my own curated list that I could share or trade or publish if I wanted to? They won't do it. And as a result, the problem there, it's not like they're going to maintain control or maintain their business. They're going to simply drive innovation to some other platform that lets them do it. Maybe it will be. A, it's, 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 yeah, I mean, look at look at the self-driving car in Google, right? Yeah, Google has driven the self-driving car forward, and it's it runs yes. on data. It doesn't run on, on gas. Right? It runs. That's on, right. It That's runs a good way. It, it runs on data. <laughs> and, and now what they've said is, you know what? We, we don't intend to build these things, right? right. But but they they force BMW and Audi and Volvo and all the other guys to say, oh shit, you know, now we have to do this yes. also, right? Yes. Uh, and this is what's happening. And I think for the media companies, if they do this. They, they become uh, sort of reactionary to this, and they usually oppose to the consumer. Yeah, and, that, that's right. and that's a bad place to be, and that, 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 has, right. to be, that has to be reversed. Anyway, we've got the end, so... Um, <laughs> we can talk if, all day here. If you guys are interested in what, what Robert Turchik and, and, and I, Gerd Leonhardt, could do for you, uh, you could ping us, and let's, uh, let's put our Twitter names here, if, uh, if you can see this. So I'm at G. Leonhardt. Okay, and... Okay, and Twitter, of course, is the way to get in touch with us. Uh, don't please don't email us. <laughs> at Superplex. At Superplex. Okay. <laughs> so uh, and it's, it's Robert Turchik dot com T E R C E K for Turchik, and I'm at futuristgert dot com. Great. That's my new URL. So if you're interested, uh, uh, we'd be happy to uh, come over and inflict some pain on you. <laughs> Thanks very much for tuning in.